philanthropy's role in disaster funding for the most vulnerable. And we're really excited to be here with folks from the Center for Disaster Philanthropy as well as the Foundation Center. My name is Biz Gormley and I'm here at the EPIP National Office. Excited to get the call started and uh, grateful for everyone who's joined us today on the line. Oops, sorry. So just wanted to begin things uh, by welcoming anyone who's new to the EPIP community and welcoming back our old friends and members as well with an introduction to who we are as an organization. EPIP, the Emerging Practitioners in Philanthropy, is a national network of foundation professionals, social entrepreneurs, and other change makers who strive for excellence in the practice of philanthropy. And what we do is provide a platform for our community to connect with each other, learn and practice leadership skills, and inspire emerging ideas in the social sector. We have 12 regional chapters, and we're always excited to get in touch with new folks. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email at biz at epip.org so we can start that conversation. Um, just looking ahead, in the next couple weeks, we have some really exciting events coming up. Um, in each chapter, there are live events. I think you should check out the epip.org's event calendar to see what's going on in your region. But also, we're really most excited to be welcoming Tamir Novotny, who's our new executive director. And on Wednesday, December 16th at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, we're going to have a town hall with him where you can join in. And I just got a message that says I have an echo, and I'm sorry about that. We tried to fix it, um, but it is not going away. So I'm almost done talking, and <laughs> hopefully it won't be an issue anymore, but thank you for letting me know. So the uh, webinar with Tamir is on December 16th at 4 p.m. Please sign up at epip.org backslash events. And know that for today, um, we will be using the question box for technical difficulties and content questions. If you have any comments or issues, I will try to fix them there. And if you are following us on social media, you can definitely use the hashtag EPIP webinar to help follow along there. Um, the webinar will be recorded today, and at the end you'll receive a post-webinar survey that should make it easy for you to send your feedback. We'd love to hear what you think, and that way we can continue to provide content that's relevant for you. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome our speakers and also quickly get a sense of who you represent and who you are, our listeners or part of the audience. Um, but first, welcome to Bob Anhoff, who's the president and CEO of the Center for Disaster Philanthropy, and Regine Webster, his colleague, who's vice president there. And welcome also to Stephen Lawrence and Grace Sato from the Foundation Center, who will be presenting alongside. We're curious to know who you guys represent. So if you can um, bring up your webinar as your front window, I'm going to launch a poll that just gives us a sense of who you are. So please um, answer this question in the poll, and we will share the results. Thank you. So it looks like majority of the folks joining us today are from foundations and philanthropic advisory firms. So we have also a collection of folks from nonprofit corporations and some entrepreneurs on the line. Great. So I am now going to turn the mic over to our esteemed and expert uh, friends at the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. Thank you so much, Biz. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the EPIP webinar, Philanthropy's Role in Disaster Funding for the Most Vulnerable. Uh, the Center for Disaster Philanthropy and Foundation Center are really delighted to speak with you all today to explore both data and stories that reveal how, when, and where philanthropy can be most supportive to these communities in, in, that are in real need following disasters. Um, 
Uh, as Biz just mentioned, my name is Regine Webster, and I'm the Vice President of the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. Today, I'm so thrilled to welcome Bob Ottenhoff, the, the Center for Disaster Philanthropy's President and CD, CEO, Stephen Lawrence, the Director of Research at Foundation Center, and Grace Sato, the Research Associate at Foundation Center. And I just am going to take two minutes here, if, if not less, to share with you a little bit about the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. And I do recognize that I, that I do have um, an echo as well. And so, um, Biz, if you, have, if you have any ideas while I'm, while I'm talking about how to fix that, that would be super. Um, if not, we'll just, we'll just roll on through. The Center for Disaster Philanthropy was, was really born out of the South Asian tsunami as well as the Hurricane Katrina experience. With the understanding and belief that private philanthropy is just incredibly well-meaning, incredibly generous, and incredibly well-resourced, but that there weren't, there weren't long-standing resources available to the philanthropic community to provide information and insight on how best to respond to disasters. And so the Center for Disaster Philanthropy was born um, desiring to be that response to private philanthropy's question, how can I help? And so we have a very strong educate and inform platform designed to support private philanthropy before, during, and after disasters. And furthermore, to encourage private philanthropy to attend to the full arc of a disaster from preparedness, mitigation, all the way through medium and long-term recovery. So today we're really going to explore a variety of case studies and research to bring to light the power of philanthropy and effective funding in the wake of disasters. Our goal is to keep this really relevant and exciting for you from the funding perspective. So if questions come up to that end, I just, you know, as Biz said, please go ahead and include them in the chat or question boxes. And at the end, we'll really head into a deep dive Q&A period that's, that's responding to the questions of most interest to you. So without further ado, let me go ahead and turn, turn the mic over to my colleagues at Foundation Center, Grace and Stephen. Thanks, Regine. And can everyone hear me clearly? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you sound great. Okay, very good. Just, you know, you're speaking into the void. Well, we're very pleased to be in our second year of partnership with Center for Disaster Philanthropy. It's been a pleasure to support them in this work. And during our remarks this afternoon, my colleague Grace Sato and I will be covering what the FC partnership with CDP looks like. We'll be talking about findings from the latest analysis of disaster-related funding. And we're also going to provide a glimpse of our newly released online platform, which can help funders, NGOs, government agencies, and other stakeholders better coordinate and make more strategic decisions. So we'll then wrap up with next steps in addressing the needs of the disaster philanthropy field. So to begin, for those of you who may not know us, although I hope all of you do, Foundation Center has been around for nearly 60 years and is the leading source of data on information and philanthropy worldwide. Now, in recent years, Foundation Center has been partnering with various organizations to make its data and information accessible through data visualization tools and issue-focused web portals. Last year, in fact, through our partnership with CDP, we were able to analyze grant-making data to present the first ever baseline snapshot of overall funding for disasters by U.S. foundations. Now, not only did it establish baseline data, this was an important first step because it confirmed what we intuitively knew about disaster-related philanthropy. And that is, when disasters strike, there's a large influx of funding in the immediate aftermath. There is far less support for long-term rehabilitation or preparedness and resilience. This year, as a follow-up to that report, we analyzed the most recent year's data on funding for disasters, which was 2013. We also know that philanthropy is just one piece of the funding landscape. Humanitarian assistance comes in the form of bilateral and multilateral aid through corporate giving programs and via online giving platforms. So this year's project integrated data from several of these other sources to provide a much more complete picture of funding for disasters. 
And with that, I'm going to turn you over to Grace, who will walk you through our latest findings and our new resources. Grace? Thanks, Stephen. So before going into the findings from this year's analysis, I'd like to say a little bit about our methodology. Um, last year, our team at Foundation Center worked with an expert technical advisory committee to develop a project taxonomy that allows us to classify disaster assistance strategies as well as various types of disasters. And my apologies for the echo again. <laughs> You can see in the diagram that the assistance strategies cover the full life cycle of disasters from resilience, risk reduction, and mitigation, to preparedness, to response and relief, and then to long-term reconstruction and recovery. Disaster types can be classified in three major buckets. The first is natural disasters, with more specific breakdowns for earthquakes and volcanoes, etc. The second category is man-made accidents, which include things like oil spills and building collapses. And third, we have complex humanitarian emergencies, which include things like the current refugee crisis. In addition, we have a fourth category for disasters general, or unspecified funding for disasters, or for multiple disparate disasters. Using this taxonomy as our guiding framework, we examined foundation funding in 2013, as Stephen said, the latest year for which we have comprehensive data. Looking at all grants of $10,000 or more reported by 1,000 of the largest U.S. foundations, we found that nearly $117 million went toward disasters. This amount is a slight increase from 2012 when giving totaled about $111 billion. The majority of funding went to natural disasters, 68%. Of these, storms captured the most grant dollars. In 2013, funders were still supporting efforts related to Hurricane Sandy, which hit in late 2012. In addition, 2013 was the year that a massive tornado struck Moore, Oklahoma. And internationally, Typhoon Haiyan, which largely affected the Philippines, resulted in more than 6,300 fatalities. With respect to assistance strategies, the largest proportion of foundation funding, again, 42%, went to response and relief efforts. 19% went to reconstruction and recovery, and an example of that is the Prudential Foundation giving a $1 million grant to the Hurricane Sandy, New Jersey Relief Fund for economic development efforts, focusing on rebuilding small businesses. 4% went to resilience, risk reduction, and mitigation. The Rockefeller Foundation, for example, has a focus on promoting and improving community resilience. In 2013, they gave a grant for a collaborative effort with USAID to incubate and accelerate innovative solutions to build long-term resilience, particularly in vulnerable populations in the Sahel, the Horn of Africa, and South and Southeast Asia. Larger U.S. foundations gave grants predominantly for disasters taking place in the U.S. 54% of grant dollars went to North America, 24% went to Asia, the Middle East, and the Pacific, 15% went for Africa, and 3% for Latin America and Mexico. So we know that responding to disasters is an enormous task that no single sector can accomplish on its own. And as Stephen mentioned, what's unique about this year's research effort is that not only did we analyze funding by U.S. foundations, we also tapped into publicly available data and looked at funding flows from other donors. And this is a, round, a rundown of what giving looks like from these other data sources. In reviewing Foundation Center's database beyond the largest funders, we documented an additional $60 million for disaster-related giving from smaller foundations and public charities. This is not a comprehensive total, but it gives you an idea of the substantial contributions smaller funders make to this field. By far, the largest flows of aid for disasters and humanitarian crises come from governments. For example, FEMA, the U.S. Federal Emergency Management Agency, distributed more than $11 billion in grants in 2013. Governments also distribute bilateral aid or giving to other countries. 
In 2013, the 29 members of the OECD Development Assistance Committee, which includes the United States, European Union, Japan, and others, reported $13.6 billion for disasters and humanitarian crises. UNOCHA, the nation's office for the coordination of humanitarian affairs, also collects information on humanitarian aid through its financial tracking service. The financial tracking service is a comprehensive source of real-time humanitarian aid contributions. Digging into their database, we identified an additional $2.4 billion in commitments and contributions from non-DAC donors and multilateral organizations. We also looked at corporate giving data based on data from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation and Foundation Center's own data collection efforts. We found at least another $179 million in pledges. Corporate giving data are not collected systematically, so these numbers are likely to be an underestimate. And this is one of the areas we'd like to focus on in the future as we aim to get better data on disaster giving. Increasingly, individuals and organizations are giving via online platforms. And again, there's no way to get at this data systematically, but we took a look at two online platforms for illustrative purposes, Global Giving and Network for Good. And in 2013, there was $27.5 million in disaster-related giving flowing through Network for Good's platform, and $3.6 million via Global Giving. Looking across all these data sources, we documented $27.6 billion for disaster assistance in 2013. Again, we know these data are not comprehensive, but they provide a picture of the scale of global disaster-related philanthropy. The print publication this year is complemented by two online data visualization tools. One is the Measuring the State of Disaster Philanthropy Dashboard, which allows users to interact with the 2013 analysis based on their specific areas of interest. So for instance, users can select the data source, which includes options from um, foundation data, OECD, UNOCHA, FEMA, corporate giving, and global giving data. Users can also filter by disaster type, assistance strategy, and by region, and customize their search by selecting a combination of filters. Users can also see top funders and top recipients for each data source, as well as sample grants. The dashboard focuses on 2013 analysis and aggregated data. For those that are interested in seeing details at the grant or disbursement level, we built a mapping platform that visualizes who's funding what where. With the mapping platform, we've included all available data from 2011 onwards, and we give users the opportunity to see disaster-related giving at a much more granular level. Like the dashboard, users can filter by disaster type and disaster assistance strategy, but here, instead of looking broadly at regions, users can drill down data to the country level or to individual U.S. states and territories. The map is set up so users can compare foundation giving to another data source. By default, the map compares foundation giving to bilateral giving of DAP donors, but this can be changed to other data sources. So selecting a country provides a close-up view of giving in that particular country. I grabbed a couple screenshots of what you can find if you were to look for grants for Syria. Users can see a list of foundation grants, as well as a breakdown by foundations and recipients. Users can also see a full list of OECD disbursements. A specific grant can be selected, which then shows even more detailed information, including the purpose of the grant. We know that foundation funding for Syrian refugees is likely to be allocated for other countries, or might not specify a country being served at all. So if users want to broaden their search, you can find at the top right under um, a drop-down that says more, a keyword search box where you can type in, for example, refugee and get a bigger list. To wrap up, operating effectively as a funder requires knowing how your work fits in the larger context, taking into account both large and smaller regional foundations and public charities we documented $177 million by foundations for disasters in 2013. 
So it's clear that foundations bring substantial resources to the table. At the same time, across sectors, we found more than $27 billion in giving, and it's important that foundations connect with the larger networks of government, individual, and corporate donors to build partnerships that can help maximize limited dollars. And with that, I'll pass it back to Stephen. Stephen, we can't hear you. If you can make sure your audio pin is in. Okay. Um, Here we go. Thanks. All right. And I sounded so good. Um, in the coming year, so we plan to make these tools more robust by improving the currency, quality, and quantity of the data. Uh, our analyses rely on publicly available data, and as Grace has pointed out, we know that there's additional giving out there that we're not accounting for, particularly for foundations outside of the U.S., as well as smaller and regional foundations and corporate giving. We'd like to work with foundation and corporate donors so that we can share their data, so they can share their data with us directly and in a more timely fashion. On the mapping platform, we'll note that we've included an Are You on the Map link that encourages donors to share their grant making data directly with us. Now, with respect to quality, one of the challenges we're faced is that we're often, we often have limited information about which specific disaster assistance strategies are being employed. So we plan to work with grant makers to provide more precise information so that we can understand more fully how donors are investing across the disaster life cycle. In the coming months, we also plan to build a data gathering network. And what that's going to do is allow us to pull in more data and paint a more complete picture of key actors in the field. Ultimately, the more we can do on this front, the better equipped our tools will be to foster collaboration and coordination in the field. We also hope that one of the takeaways from this research is that response and relief is just one part of the larger picture of the full life cycle of disasters. The full life cycles of disasters encompasses on the front end risk reduction, mitigation, preparedness and resilience efforts that can minimize the economic and human losses associated with disasters, and on the back end recovery and reconstruction efforts that can help communities rebuild and thrive following the devastation of disasters. In other words, there's an opportunity for philanthropists to be less reactive and more strategic in their disaster-related investments. So while few, if any, foundations consider themselves to be disaster philanthropists, all foundations will find themselves facing the question of how best to respond when disasters occur. So whether they acknowledge it or not, at some point, they'll find themselves in the role of disaster philanthropists. And with, so finally, I'll just note that you can access links to the dashboard and the mapping platform that Grace showed from the Center for Disaster Philanthropy website. And with that, I'm going to turn you back to Regine. Thanks so much, Stephen. Much appreciate all of your slides, and thank you so much to Grace as well. I'd like to now move from our data-driven conversation to our case study-driven conversation. And I'd like to share with you all um, about an innovative grant-making program that the Center for Disaster Philanthropy has the good fortune to run. We, over the past year, have piloted and launched the CDP Early Recovery Fund, generously supported and sponsored by the Margaret A. Cargill Foundation. And that fund allows us to award grants to organizations that are supporting the needs of vulnerable populations within communities that are affected by low attention disasters in the Midwest. And we have a very specific 10-state catchment area, and we very specifically focus on disasters that do not receive um, federal disaster declarations. So um, these definitely are under-attended disasters. We're currently awarding grants following floods, following tornadoes, um, and following huge windstorms as well. I uh, got stuck in my throat there. Um, we also are doing something quite unique. We have piloted and, and have found to be quite successful this very unique clipboard grant making process. And what that means is that the onus is on our CDP staff to fill out a proposal. 
Um, and what that does is that alleviates considerable staff time on behalf of the disaster affected grantee organization um, and, and just provides them with some hands and some technical expertise to get that request in in a really, uh, in a really streamlined process. So um, this is how we operate. Um, the Midwest Early Recovery Fund can be called upon within two weeks to one year after a natural disaster. So as I alluded to a moment before, our focus is really on tornadoes, flooding, earthquakes, landslides, and wildfires in the 10 states that are listed here on this slide. Arkansas, Iowa, Kansas, Minnesota, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, North Dakota, Oklahoma, and South Dakota. Essentially, these are the states that flank the Missouri and Mississippi River watersheds. Um, we started our work in early 2005, and our hope is, is that we'll be awarding somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 grants over the next, over, over the sum total of 30 months um, to community-based organizations and national national level disaster partners that um, support primarily disaster. Um, disaster case management, as well as services for children and youth. Our belief for that focus is that um, disaster case management and childhood and youth support in those immediate six, six, to, six weeks to six months of a funding time frame really helps a community get back on its feet and ultimately shorten the recovery timeline. So, as I mentioned, a, just a couple of bullets to underscore what I've just said is that our fund is making grants to community-based nonprofit organizations. We support the development of DCW's disaster case work or DCM disaster case management as early as possible. What we found is that if you can get systems in place um, sooner rather than later, ultimately that, that, is, that provides for a more efficient and effective support service pipeline in the months following a disaster. Uh, we focus, we have a very community driven community development approach that looks toward a long term recovery process. Um, and we really focus all of our attention on vulnerable populations. As we know, um, uh, nearly poor populations in the wake of a disaster immediately become vulnerable in a way that we could not have anticipated. And so we make sure to do needs assessments and really understand where those vulnerable abilities, uh, vulnerable populations are, excuse me. And again, just again to further underscore, we have a very heavy emphasis on supporting the needs of children post-disaster. Um, so with that as with that as a, a brief overview of our early recovery fund, I'd like to turn over the phone to Bob Ottenhoff and he'll go ahead and talk about the rest of the current refugee crisis. So without further ado, here's Bob. Thanks, Regine, and thank you all for participating in this um, uh, webinar today. I'm going to talk a little bit about refugees and displaced persons, and I prepared these remarks before Paris, and so the equation has changed, the dynamics have changed, and how that is going to change is is, um, is still uncertain. But we've already got um, a, a huge crisis on our hands. Wars, conflict, and persecution have forced more people than at any other time since World War II to flee their homes and seek refuge and safety elsewhere. Um, this is Biz. I'm going to jump in and see if we can see how you guys have participated in addressing these issues that Bob just outlined. Do a quick poll again if you guys can bring us back to your front screen and go ahead and vote on how you have gotten involved in helping address this global um, crisis. It looks like it really runs the gamut. Um, folks have been funding through their organizations that they work for, thinking about getting involved, um, definitely raising a lot of awareness. So it's great to see ways, hopefully, from your presentation, Bob, that they can continue to do so. I'll pass the mic back to you. Thanks, Biz. And those are um, uh, amazing results. Um, I I'm eager to hear 
uh, questions from the, the group in just a few minutes. So um, according to the UN, in 2014 alone, there were 14 million people that became displaced, more than four times the number of the previous year. And worldwide, there were nearly 20 million refugees. Now, of course, we know a lot of these, probably about half of them, are coming from the Middle East, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. But there's conflict all over the world. Central African Republic, Libya, Mali, Northeastern Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, Burundi, uh, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Myanmar, and Pakistan all had either refugees or internally displaced people during this past year. Now, um, this huge influx of displaced uh, persons and refugees has caused, as you can imagine, huge challenges to those providing assistance. One of the challenges, of course, is that many of the refugees and, or dis internally displaced people are, are either in poor countries or fleeing to poor or developing countries that are already starved for resources. Um, and they're often they're, they're forced to choose between meeting the needs of their permanent population or somehow grappling with the refugee population needs. And this has caused funding shortages. Early this year, the World Food Program was forced to cut food packages to refugees, for example, due to funding shortages. Uh, and so the, the point we want to leave you here on this first slide is um, what does it mean to have a, a life disrupted? Um, and think about your own situation if suddenly tonight you were forced to flee your home and go to another place. And so this causes huge disruptions in every aspect of a person's life, school, religious institutions, civic institutions, uh, the ability to raise, um, to, to, to find a job, the ability to have any savings, um, issues of violence and safety. Uh, it affects every aspect of, a, of an individual or a family's life. So um, when we think about the needs of refugees, we've placed them here on this slide into three big buckets. Uh, the force is the short-term needs and focus uh, um, primarily on uh, on Europe, uh, Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, there's still an immediate need for food, for medical relief, and now with winter coming on for um, clothing and shelter. But that's just today. Um, we think um, midterm there's going to be uh, issues like transit facilities, information needs in the countries as refugees are traveling back and forth, medical care. Um, and then basic uh, essential needs like education and and um, and commerce and edu and and building economic um, sustainability. And then long term are the issues of resettlement. Um, one of the most alarming statistics uh, about all this is that um, uh, there are very few refugees who are able to return to their home countries. So we're seeing uh, displaced uh, persons and refugees um, linger for many, many, many years um, uh, outside of their, their permanent homes. And so resettlement assistance, obtaining housing, work permits, access to medical care and education, and legal assistance in filing for asylum becomes big issues. If you or your foundation is interested in learning more about this, you can reach out to us here at CDP, uh, Regine or I can answer your questions on providing you with lists of, of quali qualified nonprofit organizations. And we've also created a fund where um, uh, donors are able to collaborate to work on this uh, together. Uh, finally, um, what can you as funders do? Um, there's three things we want you to think about. Um, one is to provide organizations with flexible funds. Uh, and this becomes so important. We talked, uh, Regina and I talked yesterday to a, um, a large organization providing funds and uh, pro providing assistance, and they said they manage very flexible budgets. They need the ability to move money from one account to another, to um, 
deal with one uh, agency or deal with one c country and then move on to another one. And so in this time of crisis, we need funders to be flexible in the monies that they do give uh, to nonprofit organizations. Secondly, we ask you to think uh, midterm about the fund resettlement needs. Um, and so many of you uh, are leaders in providing support for social services. So you know what children need. You, you know what families need. You know some of the education issues. And focus on the things you know really well that you're really um, expert at um, as you think about how you can help uh, some of these resettlement issues. And then uh, finally, uh, remember that this is a long-term crisis. Um, I mentioned before that we're not seeing people go back. Um, the Syrian crisis is now entering its fourth and um, year, fifth year perhaps. Um, it's going to be a long time till some of these are resolved. And in the meantime, we're seeing millions of children not able to go to school, uh, high unemployment, uh, issues that are going to be with us for a long time and have long-term implications, um, not only to those countries, but to the world at large. So I'm going to wrap it up there and uh, turn the microphone back to Biz at this point. Thanks, everybody. I think there's a phenomenal amount of content and information. Um, we are really, truly grateful for you sharing all of it. I'm going to go ahead and first um, ask folks to think about any questions they have lingering from either the content or the larger issue of disaster philanthropy and uh, so go ahead and write those into the question box. Um, I will read out any questions that we get and ask our experts to respond to them. But also in the meantime while you're writing in your questions, I'm going to go ahead and pop up the um, slide that gives you the link to be able to uh, put, to be able to access the dashboard and mapping platform that Grace presented to us earlier. So just one second, bear with me. So this is the slide that, um, that I was referencing so that we want to make sure you guys have that as a resource to return to. And please feel free to type in your questions. Um, I'm curious just to start off the question section looking at the results from the survey that um, shows the spread of ways people have been involved. Um, can you give examples that maybe are a case study or example of the funders who go ahead and kind of cross that line for the first time disaster philanthropy maybe that folks can point their teams to, to to understand what it looks like to get into this work for the first time? I've gone ahead and unmuted all of our uh, panelists. If you guys have thoughts on that question, we'd love to hear them. We also have some coming in for the audience now. So first question from the audience is, do you have suggestions for funders that are focused on educational opportunities for quote-unquote stateless children that often result from disasters or typical, typically conflict-related? If um, Bob, Grace, Regina, or Steve, if any of you guys have thoughts on that. Liz, can you just read it again? I, I'll be honest, I missed the first part of your question. Sorry. The question is, do you have suggestions for funders that are focused on educational opportunities for stateless children that often result from disasters or conflict? Absolutely. I mean, you know, um, Save the Children in particular has really strong educational programs. Um, and they are supporting the needs of children, not only across Europe, but as, but also as well in Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan. Um, Plan also has, Plan International also has very strong programming. World Vision and Care, in terms of other large international NGOs, um, 
and Islamic Relief as well also have a nice, have really strong focus on kids. And, and by the way, to whomever asked the question, I'll just echo that that's a terrific question to ask. You're looking at effectively five years of kids having no access to regular schooling, and so the needs that they present to us is, is, um, is overwhelming, and so anything a funder can do to support those educational needs, I, I'll just applaud. I'll applaud from over here at my desk. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question. The question is, I'm wondering what implications foreign policy has in funding disaster relief. For example, the EU response to the refugee crisis makes it difficult to have confidence in funding being used in a coordinated way when the EU itself is not entirely coordinated. Could you guys speak to that? I will, I, oh, this is Regine. I will take this, but I, I don't want to claim expertise on this. Um, you know, this is a protracted, complex humanitarian emergency that is in so many ways messy and complicated and, and only more so by the day. So certainly a lot of arrows or stones could be thrown in a lot of directions to point to areas where there is a lack of coordination or a lack of funding or a lack of appropriate response. Um, but, but rather than highlight the, the myriad of those areas, I'd rather have us say, you know, focus our time and attention today on where philanthropy, right, where the, the relatively small but completely nimble and, um, and impactful dollars from private philanthropy can, can flow, and they can have a real benefit on children's access to edu education. They can be forward thinking in terms of economic development and um, and livelihood production going forward. Um, th they can provide shelter. They can provide easy relocation support when the International Organization for Migration is able to resettle refugees. So there's a, a lot of different ways that philanthropy can support that are not band-aid in nature, but rather are the truest and most pure form of humanitarian assistance. Our next question follows nicely after that uh, response, actually, Regine. The question is um, about philanthropy's role and looking uh, a little more, more broadly at the recent anti-refugee sentiment and political attacks is the question is what is philanthropy's role in resisting this recent anti-refugee sentiment and political attacks? Uh, this is Bob Ottenhoff. Um, well, we don't know yet what's going to happen, but the um, the outbreak of uh, anti-refugee sentiment that we saw in Europe develop over the last few months um, is now evident here in the United States, and um, it's something we're going to have to deal with. I think people are uh, are suspicious. They're un they're uneasy, um, and I think that's going to be become part part of the environment uh, uh, as we deal with 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 the refugee issues I think there are roles that foundation can play in educating and informing the American public I think there are roles we can play in helping to make uh, those who do come to the United States uh, have a positive experience when they settle here in the United States I think there are roles we can play in making sure that the refugee crisis in, in Europe is perhaps less uh, chaotic, more organized, more managed than it's been uh, up until now. So there are going to be issues for some of the roles that foundations typically play as conveners, as educators, as um, those who bring people together to, um, to have an informed dialogue about uh, issues confronting our communities. But it isn't going to be easy. I think this is going to be a um, challenging time period and I think in the short term 
uh, it is going to hurt um, the amount of dollars that are raised. Uh, in fact, um, Joel Charney from Interaction was on National Public Radio just last night saying that he thought in the short term this would have an adverse effect on our ability um, to, to, raise, um, to raise money. But he also made the point that we're not helping terrorists. We're helping vulnerable populations. And it's the perpetrators of the violence in Syria that are driving people to flee. So let's not punish the victims, and let's see if we can help the American public uh, to understand that. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Going back to the research and our um, friends at the Foundation Center, since there are so many folks on the line from foundations and philanthropic advisory firms themselves, I'm curious if there are ways that you guys can highlight um, continued opportunities for dialogue and ways for philanthropies and um, philanthropic funds to be involved in research and be involved in this um, kind of dialogue going forward. Well, I'll take the first stab at this and then let Grace follow up. Um, the, so I think there are many ways to be involved. Certainly, you know, becoming engaged with the Center for Disaster Philanthropy um, and, you know, being a part of supporting that work is important. You know, as we talked about, certainly from Foundation Center's perspective, playing a role in improving the data and improving the quality of the data, getting more information about how foundations have been responding to disasters, I think is especially useful. Uh, because that's, that's where we're going to get a sense of who the players are. Because, you know, we've, we've, the work with CDP has built on earlier work Foundation Center has done, tracking the response to 9-11, uh, to Hurricane Katrina, and to other disasters where, you know, such as Hurricane Sandy most recently, where we, where we honed in on specific areas. And in those cases, for example, we saw a leading role that was played by regional associations of grant makers in terms of responding to disasters. And as the foundation community works, community foundations are often on the front lines of responding to a range of disasters, certainly in the domestic context. Uh, so they can be in a very important resource as well. Grace, I don't know if you have other thoughts on that or, or Bob and Regine. Yeah, I would just highlight what you had said during your presentation too, that the you know, that the map displays kind of the landscape of foundations that are um, giving disaster grants, but we only have that data based on the descriptions that are in the grants that we review. And so to the degree that foundations can be explicit in how they're giving out this disaster grants and sharing that data with us and um, the are you on the map kind of uh, campaign that Foundation Center is launching to get more current data on grant making and I think particularly for disasters that would be really um, informative and helpful to the field to get more real-time data on grants that are being dispersed and so getting more foundations involved in that would be great. Um, those are things that sort of come to mind. Great. I um, am just going to once again thank all of you for joining us. Um, if folks have more questions, happy to go ahead and have them answered by the panelists now. If there are closing remarks from the panelists, um, would love to give you an opportunity to say any final words before we log off. Um, this is Regine. I'll just uh, thank everybody who's hopped on the line. Just your work to participate on this phone call to me demonstrates an interest in the humanitarian assistance needs and improving the way that private philanthropy responds to and prepares for um, prepares for disasters. Um, Bob and I are an open book. You're more than welcome to call or email either of us. My email is regine.webster at disasterphilanthropy.org. Bob's email is bob.ottenhoff at disasterphilanthropy.org. You can see our contact information at the bottom of the screen here. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak with you all. Great. And this is Stephen at Foundation Center. You know, just want to really credit my colleague, Grace Sato and Seema Shah, our Director of Research for Special Projects, who've really been leading the work 
on tracking disaster philanthropy on the foundation center side. And I think, you know, I, I think the team with CDP have just created an invaluable resource that we hope you'll make use of, but we also want to continue improving. So as you have opportunity to make use of the reports, of the platforms, the dashboard, you know, if you have ideas for other things to include or potential improvements we could make, please be sure that, to send them to us or, or I'll direct them directly to Grace, GMS at foundationcenter.org. You know, we really, we want, what makes tools useful is when they're living and when they continue to evolve and ever better serve the needs of users. So we, we hope you'll let us know if you have any ideas. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. It is really amazing level of content and obviously each day even more pressing issues to be discussing. So thank you for bringing forward this deep um, expertise and also the opportunities for us all to take new steps going forward. I'm looking forward to continue to stay in touch and for all of our audience members, thank you for your time. Please take a moment just to complete the survey at the end. Feel free to reach out to me, biz at epip.org with any questions. And we'll look forward to seeing you guys back here at our next Wednesday webinar. Thanks so much.